beginning, the god created beast and man so that both might live in friendship. Evil men betrayed God's trust and it waged bloody wars, not only against their own kind, but against the apes. Our savior led a remnant of those who survived in search of greener pastures where ape and human might forever live in friendship. Welcome to Lawgiver, a Planet of the Apes podcast. My name's Tom Elliott, and here we are with the final issue of Beware the Planet of the Apes from Marvel Comics. Now, before we continue, I need to correct an error from the previous podcast, because I mistakenly referred to the leader of the mutants as Lila, but her name was actually Ivana. Lila is one of her followers who appears in the story, but I'm not the only one who's made a mistake with this iteration of Planet of the Apes, because the opening recap page of these issues has stated that George Taylor left Earth in 1972 and that Brent followed him in 1979. And I have seen comments about this online, so let's straighten this out by referring to a book by the Oracle himself, Rich Handley. And the book I'm talking about is The Lexicon of the Planet of the Apes, which is a great, rich resource for Planet of the Apes fans. And in it, Rich Handley writes, Brent, John Christopher Major, an answer astronaut assigned to follow the trajectory of the spacecraft Liberty One in 1972 to determine what became of George Taylor and his missing crew. And he also confirms in the entry about Taylor that Taylor left in 1972. So from what Rich Handley says, the Liberty One with Taylor on it and the Liberty Two with Brent on it both left in 1972. So I'm not quite sure why the comic says 1979, but if anyone knows, then do let me know. Now, if you've made it this far, you know that there are spoilers ahead, and this is the final issue, so proceed with caution. But to be honest, it's going to be quite a light review because this is really just wrapping up things that we've spoke about already. And the issue opens with the mutants attacking the Hominidae Empire, and as the battle rages, Cornelius makes his way to a locked area where a group of gibbons are being kept. The Gibbons are essentially slaves to the guerrillas of the Hominidae Empire, and Cornelius tries to convince them to join the fight, but they are reluctant to. So Gibbons are apes, but not the kind that could have been portrayed by humans in the original Planet of the Apes movies. So I appreciate that they're represented here, gently expanding our understanding of this world, without pushing it too far. Because while I do love the original Marvel comics, they did often venture into crazy territory. Which is fine, you know, it's a take, it's enjoyable stuff. But here, there's an effort to stay more aligned with what the original films might have shown if they could, and I appreciate that. So as the battle goes on, we learn from Lucius that the Hominidae Empire plans to invade Ape City, raising the stakes even higher. But thankfully, after a rousing speech by Cornelius, the Gibbons attack, and with some help from Ivana's mutant powers, the battle is won. Now the resolution does feel rather quick. I do wonder whether another issue to let these events breathe a little bit would have been nice, but what we do get is good and it is entertaining but for a conclusion it does feel a little bit quick now the end of the book places this story just before the first movie and the crash of taylor's ship as i predicted at the end of the second issue when we saw that there were mutants involved cornelius zira and lucius all have their minds wiped at the end of the comic ensuring continuity with the first film Nova, however, 
doesn't have her mind wiped. Like R2-D2 in Revenge of the Sith, she retains her memories, likely because she can't talk and her people are primitives, so it doesn't really matter as much. But as I've said throughout, one criticism that I do have of the series is the depiction of Nova. In this series, she seems to be quite advanced. She's able to ride horses, she uses weapons, and she even gives advice to Ivana when Ivana links to her telepathically. And in the first two films, she's a primitive who is slightly advanced by her interactions with Taylor and Brent, so I think this comic gives her more credit than is actually warranted. But it is a minor thing, it's not a deal breaker because, as I've said before, I think when a comic is kind of inserting itself into the timeline like this, you can take it or leave it. You don't really have to take it as part of your canon if you don't want to. You can just enjoy it for what it is. But in the end, even with their memories wiped, the comic nicely ties this story to Cornelius and Zira's future. Ivana mentions that although they won't remember the events that have just happened to them, the experiences will remain in their subconscious, possibly shaping their future actions. So when Taylor and Brent do eventually land, what happens is this makes Cornelius and Zira a little bit more receptive to them. One of the other things that I've enjoyed is seeing this different sect of mutants. They're more normal compared to the religious zealot mutants in the second movie, which shows that people can differ greatly in different places. And it adds potential for using mutants in various ways in the future. I think the world building around Ape City has been fantastic, bringing to life the surrounding areas without impacting the movie's continuity. They've really fleshed out what's going on around Ape City and I, I really enjoyed that. And in a way it's quite sad that the writers are constrained by movie continuity because the interactions between the apes, the humans, the mutants and the Hominidae Empire have been a highlight. And I think a longer series exploring the balance of power in the region would have been great. So overall, I think there's a lot to like in this series and I look forward to reading the whole thing again as one piece when the collected issue comes out in September. But as of now, I'm not aware of what comes next with Marvel. It wouldn't surprise me if it was some sort of tie-in to Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes because one thing I have been a little bit disappointed by is that the previous movies have been well served with prequel novels, novelizations, tie-in comic books, but I haven't seen any mention of that with this new movie coming out and I hope that that is rectified soon. But on the subject of Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes, it's been nice to see that it's been received very well seems to be doing well, which is quite difficult in this day and age. I think the movie landscape is changing and some of those surefire wins aren't really surefire wins anymore. But Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes seems to be, seems to be one of the ones that's still doing okay. So I will cover that in some fashion in the future, probably on the home release. But Lawgiver the Podcast will probably go back into semi-hibernation for the moment, I just saw an opportunity with these comics to maybe do some quick reviews of them. But down the line, I would like to do some of the kind of deep dives that I did with the Rod Serling's Planet of the Apes episode. You know, those deep dives with clips and trivia and that kind of thing. That is my goal. But I thought while this series is coming out, I might as well just talk about it briefly. But I'm heading back over to the Twilight Zone podcast for now. And then, as I've said all along, when that finishes, I'll be on Lawgiver full time. But I'm sure there's going to be a few episodes in the intervening time. So I will speak to you then. Bye for now. We still wait 
my children. But as I look at apes and humans living in friendship, harmony, and the peace, now some 600 years after Caesar's death, at least we wait with hope for the future.